And we didn't know it for some grandiose reason. Back to the family, the first political unit. Each of us saw our mothers and our fathers as destroyed people. And when we explained to ourselves, crudely and simply in the early years, as we were slowly becoming able to think about anything, we made the determination separately, which we then talked about later, that what this system had done is broken those people around us that we loved and that we depended on and that we fought with had really broken them. Steve's father had severe mental difficulties. My mother had severe emotional difficulties, on and on and on. And for us, it was the system that had destroyed them. I don't know how exactly we got to that way of thinking, but we did. And it made us want to take a long, hard, angry look at how this system worked to produce such a breakage of people, such pain, such suffering, such misery. And that's real powerful at the beginning, and it carries you through. And even though we thought a lot about other things later in our life, I think it's fair to say of Steve and of me that that notion of a system that really has lost, if it ever had it, the right to stay the trap in which human beings find themselves, that really has to go. And if we can help do that, raise an awareness of how this system works in ways that are so destructive, then we will have done something important. And when we encountered Marxism, me in my way, Stephen is, we encountered a body of thought that rang true to us in terms of those objectives. This was a system critique. It wasn't about this or that detail. And you'll see how important that is in a few minutes. It wasn't about this or that argument in the Marxian canon. It was the whole feeling that Marx, a young man growing up in the euphoria of Europe's celebration of the French Revolution, the young Marx for whom liberté, égalité, fraternité were these wonderful images of a new world, the world that the French Revolution and the American Revolution and even earlier the British uh, Civil Wars had opened up, a society of liberty, equality, fraternity. They loved this. They, they, they dreamed this. They, they marched to the music of Beethoven, if he comes back into my story, who celebrates in all his music this same business. And then Marx is the thinker who says, 30, 40 years later, the revolution that brought in capitalism, but claimed it was bringing in human freedom, equality, liberty, has betrayed us. Capitalism isn't delivering liberty, equality, and fraternity. Nothing of the sort. They hustled us. They told us a transition from feudalism to capitalism would bring in freedom. It doesn't. Nowhere. It can't. Capitalism isn't the end of exploitation. It's just another form of the same thing. And then Marx set to work to show it, to make the argument that feudalism is one exploitative arrangement of some people producing surplus for others, and capitalism is another one. We didn't break out of it in the French Revolution. We just changed the form of it. The breakout remains to be done. That's what we found in Marx, that argument. And it meant the world to us. It allowed us to explain what had gone wrong. Why this system was as horrific now, in its unique way, as the revolutionaries in France and in America had found the old exploitative feudalism to be so awful back then. That Marx is the theorist for our time 
who teaches what went wrong so that we can begin to try to figure out how to fix it, how to do better. How to do better than this capitalism rather than remain stuck in it. So then Steve and I went to work in the years at UMass, starting in the middle 70s, to learn the Marxism at first. We hadn't understood it all that well. Our introductions were superficial, to say the least. Um, and so we went to work, and we really worked. The first years at UMass, Steve and I read, read, read like crazy. We gave each other assignments. We would read over a week or two and come back with notes and discuss it here at UMass while we were teaching. We didn't write all that much. We read. And the more we read the Marx, the more we read also the kinds of Marxists who took the work further. And some of you might be interested in, in who the people were that grabbed us. First, for all kinds of complicated reasons, we discovered that Lenin had a lot to teach us. That besides being the leader of the Soviet Revolution, this was a very sophisticated thinker whose book about the economic development of capitalism in Russia was a stunning revelation to us. How he thought through what had happened in that society. Huge fat book. Took us a long time to read through. And then, as we began to discover the richness of Marxism, which none of, neither of us had understood, we began to get excited by writers like Lukács, who we then went through and read, and Gramsci, the prison notebooks that were very important to us. These people were opening up a range of Marxism that we had never imagined, that made our economics much richer and much more exciting than the narrow approach we had had to Marxian economics because of the narrowness of our training in neoclassical and Keynesian economics before that. But the real thing that blew us out of the water was an accident. One of us, I don't even remember which one of us it was, picked up this book by two British sociologists, Hindus and Hirsch, Pre-Capitalist Modes of Production, published in 1975, just when we were here beginning. And we couldn't get over it. This was the most amazing <laughs> Marxist study of how to do economic history that we had ever seen. It was the theoretical sophistication behind what had been until that moment the man whose work had shaped more our thinking more than anybody else was the British Marxist economist Maurice Dobb, whose work we read from beginning to end with intensity uh, that was wonderful for us as a, as a learning experience. But Dobb was a wonderful historian. He had a lot of theory in it. But Hindus and Hearst formalized all of that in with a rigor and a, wow, we couldn't get over it. And then as we read, we began to realize that Hindus and Hearst were taking all their clues not from economists, but from a French philosopher, <clears throat> Louis Althusser. And this was new to us. And we decided, now go back. We can do anything. If we can hold our families together, we can certainly branch out and spend a couple of years learning philosophy. If that's what it took, well, we would do it. And we did. We read Althusser from beginning to end. Uh, Steve and I in English, me a little bit in the French to see if there was something there in the French that wasn't getting translated, etc., etc. And then with the extraordinary excitement of what this meant, this way of being Marxist without some of the baggage that came with Marxism that we didn't like, and I'm going to get to that in a minute because it's part of our politics. Althusser was free of that baggage. Althusser was teaching us how to be a Marxist in a way that didn't require you to salute things we could not accept. And that was an incredible breakthrough for us. So I made the decision, and this was crucial, in the first year of sabbatical that I had, 1979, that I would go in the summer to Paris and using connections from my family, see if I could work with Althusser and present to him what Steve and I had made of his work and what we were proposing then to do with that work. 
And we didn't say it to each other, but the real reason we were going there was we wanted him to pat us on the head and say, good work, go ahead, nice boy, keep going. I think that's what we wanted. So I, I went to Paris, and I met with Althusser, in his, he was at that time the, the rector of the École Normale Supérieure, which is the French equivalent of being at Harvard or something like that. It's the leading school of philosophy in, in France, and he was a, a professor there, but to be the rector is even higher than to be the professor. It's important to mention that to you because he, Althusser, had been at that time for many, many years an outstanding public member of the French Communist Party. And for an American to discover that you could be the rector of the foremost philosophy school and a noteworthy member of the Communist Party suggested that the United States was even more backward politically than I already understood it at that time to be, since that clearly wasn't possible here then, and that isn't possible here now either. But it was in France. And I worked that summer with Althusser. I met him and his wife and the people he worked with at that time. Um, I told him what Steve and I were doing. And he was fascinated. He had no idea that Americans even knew that he existed, let alone that his work was important. Um, and he was very excited about what we were doing, he introduced me to <coughs> students of his in Paris and so forth. And it made Steve and I just take off. It was, it was a, what we needed. We needed the master to tell us, hmm, you're doing a nice job. And I remember leaving his office the second time I was there, walking immediately down the corner of, for those of you who know Paris, the Rue Dune, which is right in the middle of the, uh, the Sorbonne area there in Paris, uh, on the left bank, and going to a post office nearby and writing out a telegram to Steve to tell him what the basic reaction of Althusser was to what we had done. <laughs> and I think at that point, we kind of took off. We wrote an essay around that time in which we tried to work with what we were learning uh, to formulate a debate with uh, Sam Bowles and Herb Gintis about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. It was one of the first articles we wrote together, published in the RRPE about that subject. Um, but it really meant for us, we were now ready to go. We could develop a Marxian theory that was free of those elements that we could never accept. We could never accept in the Marxian tradition that economics determines the rest of what goes on. It never made sense to us. It contradicted our own personal lives. What had happened in our families was much more complicated than an economic difficulty of our mothers and our fathers. It, it, it didn't work. And we were always troubled by the economic determinism that was part of the Marxian tradition. We didn't know how to get out of that. Althusser helped us, and so we were very grateful. And we also knew that we didn't want to use Marxism like a cookbook. Pick a little bit here, pick a little bit there, and run with the ball. Get excited about the general law of capitalist accumulation in volume one, and make that the beginning and the end of what you do. Or yank out the chapters on the declining rate of profit and build your notion of Marxism on that. Or take the, the, the few chapters on the relationship between values and prices and imagine that this is it. We thought there was an integral unity to what Marx was about, a basic project. And that's what we were interested in. And then we would see how the parts came together. And that was a different approach. And we were looking for how to do that. And in the process, not only did we distance ourselves from our fellow Marxian economists. To give you an example, the 100 years before Steve and I go to work in this area, one of the most exciting topics for Marxist economists had been the relationship between values and prices endless articles and books that we waded through an activity I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. <laughs> we waded through them more than once, trying to figure out what was going on until it dawned on us that there was a kind of category mistake here, that, that Marx didn't mean by prices what these articles assumed the word price meant. 
we were slowly discovering that different theoretical frameworks that use the same word don't mean the same thing by the same word. And it's a terrible mistake to assume otherwise. Marx doesn't use the word price the way neoclassicals use it. It doesn't. You could make a translation, but this is not what the project is about. Well, what was Marx's project about? What was this unifying thing that we could see as a way to understand it all? What was the political analog? How did our political distaste for a system we found so oppressive, how did it show up in the theory? How did we connect it? And the answer was to see in Marx a new kind of unity, theoretical unity, that the people we had learned so much from hadn't seen. It's the only way I know how to say it. Steve and I talked often, how do you say this to a student in a class? How do you do it? And here's the unity we, we saw. For us, the volumes of capital, which remained the centerpiece of Marx's achievement, turned out to be what they seemed to be. They were discussions about the surplus, what a surplus is, how it's produced, by whom, who gets it, and what do they do with it? And how does the getting and the doing with the surplus shape a society in a particular way? For us, volume one lays out how the surplus is produced, and volumes two and three, how it circulates and gets distributed. And therein you have the framework to understand the uniqueness of capitalism because it's a unique way of handling the surplus. And it allows you suddenly to say, gee, it's different from feudalism and slavery because those are other ways of handling the surplus. And it's different from socialism and communism because it, those are yet other ways of handling the surplus. Ah, now we have a way to distinguish the different. And we have a way historically to periodize around these differences. Things are beginning to fall together for us, and we get really excited. And in that excitement, we try to catch up our students, and I think between what we were teaching and the way we were teaching and our own excitement about it, the students picked that up. Lord knows I remembered my teachers, and I remember swearing to myself. Steve used to laugh when I would tell him these stories swearing to myself that if ever I was in a situation where 20 or 30 people had to sit for an hour and a half with me, staring at me and listening to me, I would never do to them what my teachers had so systematically done to me, which teach me levels of boredom and horror and <laughs> tiredness that I otherwise never experienced. I wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It's too disrespectful of other people. Just, it just, it's too horrible. And we didn't have to worry about it because what we were doing was so exciting to us. So much the realization of a way to do theory that was both novel, that could distance itself from the parts of the old that we had to distance ourselves from, yet be loyal and appreciative of the tradition out of which we came. That's what this was now enabling us to do, to do all those things, and to teach effectively, and to excite students. So we really took off. And I believe all those things came together. That's the only reason why we could write the books together that we did, teach the way we did, write all the articles. And there was a politics there, too, that deserves a comment. And maybe here I come closest to talking about our political situation in our department. Steve and I were most of the time pretty out front that we were Marxists and we were happy to be Marxists. We weren't hesitant, we weren't frightened, we weren't ashamed. Well, of course, you didn't have to be frightened. We had tenure at a university. It was paying us a nice salary. So we did have that and I understand how important that is. But we didn't, we didn't hide it. We didn't pull our punches most of the time. Many of our colleagues did. 
either because they didn't agree with what we were saying or because it was too scary and too dangerous to do that for your career, for your future, for whatever it is you hold dear. But we didn't. And it didn't hurt our careers real badly. Our books got published, our articles got published. The first time we wrote the Althusserian stuff down in a systematic way, we took the manuscript to the University of Chicago Press. Why? Partly because there was an editor who seemed friendly. But partly Steve and I couldn't get over the delicious thought <laughs> that the University of Chicago Press, on whose editorial board we were told, although I, I never found out whether it's actually true or not, we were told to sat one Milton Friedman. <laughs> It was just too delicious to put them through the process of having to deal with the book. And when they decided to publish it, we were very happy. We <laughs> thought it was a wonderful message to the economics profession. My goodness, look what the University of Chicago is willing to publish in this day and age. And exactly the same thought crossed our mind when Many of you in this room, having told us that that textbook we wrote years ago that compares theories, neoclassical, Keynesian, and Marxian, when it was time to update it, which Steve and I did, was the last book together we wrote was that updated version of that book. Uh, when we realized how much the world had changed, our first book, Knowledge in Class, we shopped around. This last one, the Contending Economic Theories, we were, for the first time and the only time in Steve and my life as, as authors, we were the focus of a bidding war, which is a charming position to be in for folks like us. Four publishers wanted that book, uh, and one of them was the MIT Press. And with the same enjoyment that we went to Chicago back in 1987, we decided to go with MIT for this one, thinking that it would be a nice moment when all kinds of people picked up a book of, uh, that is to be a textbook in comparing economic theories that is written by two clearly defined, self-defined, happy-go-lucky Marxists. And they, when the MIT decided to do it, we were very happy, and that's why that happened. That way, we rejected the other um, three suitors. We were Marxists who got published. We were Marxists who got recognized. We were Marxists, even at a time of the Cold War, and then when the Soviet Union collapsed, and all kinds of people who had uh, been more or less leftist like us, decided that somehow the collapse of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe was a sign that they shouldn't be that anymore. A move neither Steve or I could ever understand. A total mystery. Significant colleagues of ours, who had always disliked the Soviet Union and China, now used the collapse of them as an explanation for why they should stop being leftists or socialists or Marxists or anything else like that. Very strange. I remember trying to explain to one of them that capitalism arose out of feudalism a hundred thousand times in different parts of Europe. Lasted in some cases weeks, some cases months, some cases years, some cases decades, and then collapsed before the conditions came together for capitalism to become the prevailing system. Why would they imagine that anything different would happen in the transition from capitalism to whatever came next? Many of our fellow Marxists around the country have always had a hard time with what Steve and I are doing. Many a time, Steve and I would come back from having given a talk at some other university or gone to give a talk at a conference separately, and we would regale each other, sometimes with real pain, about the remarkable fact that we would talk to audiences that weren't leftists and get much better receptions than we would get from audiences that were. Audiences that weren't Marxist were much more open, in general, to what we had to say than audiences who defined themselves as Marxist. It was painful. It was difficult. Something about the direction we were going in was 
a problem. And we were helped in understanding that again by Althusser and the difficulties, difficulties he had by what happened in this country with the explosion of postmodernism and the difficulties it encountered and still does. Um, and we realized that our foray into philosophy and epistemology gave us a clear understanding of the position we were taking. And that our fellow economists had never done these sorts of things, had never spent the time learning this kind of stuff. They weren't interested in it. And it made it harder for us to explain what we were trying to do and to get it across in a way that would make sense. So let me now bring it to a close so that there's time for those who might want to raise questions or comments about all of this. <coughs>